All right, now, you know I'd like to see your Bibles. <clears throat> May I see them? <clears throat> Are you getting an idea yet? Okay, some of you don't have a Bible. That's really sad. Um, see the elders? They'll get you one. Or if you left it at home, bring it, because we need you to have your Bibles. Sometimes I'll ask you to turn to a verse of Scripture, and <clears throat> so it's very, very helpful. All right. This morning, I want to talk with you about the uh, gospel of Christ. Not a gospel, not some message which is purported to be the gospel. I mean, all you have to do is turn on your radio or TV or some other kind of media, and you'll see all kinds of things purported to be the gospel, but they're not the gospel. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the gospel of Christ. It's very simple. And I would ask you to turn to Romans 1, verse 14 and following. <clears throat> Verses 14 through 17 have traditionally been regarded, and I think rightly so, the theme of the book of Romans. <clears throat> and Paul begins in Romans 1, 14 by saying, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. Well, why is that, Brother Paul? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. And then he goes on in verse 17 to tell why that is. Because therein is, what does he say? The righteousness of God. Therein, in the gospel, is revealed the righteousness of God. It's revealed from faith to faith, as it is written and then he quotes Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you about the gospel. Notice that verse 17 says, in the gospel. Now what is the gospel? It's the message, okay? In that blessed message is the righteousness of God. Now sometimes <clears throat> we speak of righteousness like it's an attribute. So we might talk about the love of God, the mercy of God. And when we say the love of God, mercy of God, etc., we're talking about a particular attribute that God has. And so we might talk about the righteousness of God <clears throat> in a similar way, namely as an uh, attribute. But I think here the emphasis is not so much on a divine attribute as it is on a divine activity. Because <clears throat> what we learn here is in the gospel of Christ... <clears throat> Excuse me. In the gospel of Christ is revealed the means by which God makes us righteous. That's really what he's saying. In the gospel is the righteousness of God. It's the way God makes us right. You see, if you've not believed and obeyed the gospel, then you can't be right with God. You're estranged from God. You're separated from God, as Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And so, when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, now you've been made righteous by God through the gospel message. I like to say it this way. The gospel righteouses us. Without obedience to the gospel, you cannot be made righteous. You are estranged. You cannot be in good standing with God. And so... How important is the gospel? Oh, it's profoundly important. None of us can be saved without the blessed gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to raise one simple question. What is the gospel? And I've got three or four or five responses. Uh, we'll see how they go. All right? The gospel, number one, is something that God wants us to preach. After Christ taught and trained his disciples, he died on that rugged cross, he was buried, and he arose again on the third day. He remained on the earth for a few days, and during that time, among other things, he gave what we call the Great Commission. And as I said in Bible class, it's recorded in different places. And I use Matthew 28 for the Bible class, but I want to use Mark 16 uh, now. In verse 15, the Bible says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the commission. 
Well, Brother David, can you simplify that? No, I can't. <laughs> Go where? Into all the world and do something. Do what? Preach. Preach what? The gospel. Preach it to whom? To every creature. My brother Alan, I was raised in Mississippi in the country. And when I was trying to um, develop some lessons and so forth, I'd go out, you know, in the woods nearby and I preached to uh, squirrels and, and um, every, any other kind of living creature that would listen to me. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about human beings. Go preach the gospel to all mankind. And so we have that responsibility. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid on me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now I wonder if there's one or more in the audience today who might be saying at this time, Well now brother, brother David thinks he's at some kind of preacher retreat and that he's talking to preachers. He's gone off the map. Well I may have gone off the map some, but that's not, I ain't gone that far. I know I'm not at a preacher's retreat. I'm talking to the body of Christ here today. And even though the word preach is found there, we don't need to limit the commission just to those who preach the gospel as I and others do. All of us have the responsibility to communicate the good news. Is that right? To share that news in some shape, form, or fashion. When you go to work tomorrow, you're going to talk about something. I wish that you would have these kinds of words. Wow, we had a great day yesterday at at our congregation. We're going to be meeting, you know, for a few nights, you know, to study more about the gospel. Hope that you will come. See, you're going to talk about something, say something about the gospel effort that we're involved in. Listen to me. There's nothing more important than obeying the gospel of Christ. There's not any other decision, you know, that would be more important, you know, than that. And so that's what we're emphasizing this week. <clears throat> what is the gospel? It's something God wants us to share with people, to tell people about. You know, there are a lot of churches of Christ in this area, right? Some of those churches may be looking for a preacher. I get a call nearly every week, Brother Larry, of some some, by some congregation want me to help them find a preacher. <clears throat> Let's say that here's a congregation that's looking for a preacher. And I want to use an illustration that's old as Noah. But bear with me, indulge me. Because I think it makes a point. And the word gets out. You know, maybe at a preacher's meeting it's been announced that, you know, Chitlin Switch Church of Christ is looking for a preacher or or, or whatever. or You know, the gospel advocate used to have little um, clips in there about a preacher uh, looking for a place to preach and congregations looking for a preacher. The Jenkins Institute, you know, has something like that and so forth and so on. At any rate, this man learns of a congregation looking for a preacher. And so he sends a letter to the elders and says, Dear brethren, I understand that y'all are looking for a preacher. I'm a preacher and I would like to apply for the work there. But I'm very straightforward, and I just want you to know some things about me, um, you know, firsthand. First of all, I want you to know that I'm an old man. Some call me the aged one. In the second place, I'd like for you to know that I'm not married. I never have been married, and I don't have any plans on getting married. Number three, I think you should know that churches with which I've worked in the past have had problems. And number four... I think you brethren should know that I just got out of jail. I'm very interested in the work, and I hope to hear from you and discuss this matter uh, even more. Now, can you imagine some elders coming together? And, and you have the chairman of the month. You know, a lot of car elderships do that. And he's reading the letter. And then he, he finishes it, and then he looks to his fellow elders and says, Can you imagine this knucklehead wanting to apply for our work? I mean, look what he says. In the first place, he says he's an old man. We can't have some old man. I mean, who's going to uh, run here and run there and do this and do that? And then, as I said earlier, congregations ask me frequently, you know, to help them find a preacher. And I always ask them, I said, well, what age preacher do you want? Oh, Brother David, we don't want anybody over 35. 
and I love to do this because they usually know me and they love me. And I'd say, I kind of drop my head, you know, I'm on the phone and I say, well, I guess that means I can't apply. Oh no, brother David, we're not talking about you. And I said, well, you just said, you know, nobody over 35. I said, I'm more than twice that age. But that's what they say a lot of times. You know, guys like me are not ready to go out to pasture yet. All right? But at any rate, we can't have an old man. And number two, he's not married. Well, we got to have a married man. I mean, tradition in churches of Christ has always been to hire two people for one salary. I mean, we got to have that woman. I mean, who's going to take care of our benevolence? Who's going to take care of our ladies' class? Who's going to um, run the copier? Who's going to, you know, all the tasks that are put on a preacher's wife sometimes? So we got to have two people, and we don't want to pay but one of them. And then number three, he says, you know, he's been at places where there are problems. Lord knows we've got enough problems as it is. And then number four, what would the community think when they heard we had a jailbird in the pulpit? Of course, you know of whom I speak, I'm sure. Wasn't it Brother Paul who said he was the aged one? Wasn't it Brother Paul who said he had the right to have a wife, but he didn't? Wasn't it Brother Paul that had countless problems with churches? And wasn't it Brother, uh, Brother Paul also who was imprisoned you know, because of his stand for Jesus Christ? Listen to me. The Apostle Paul took seriously the gospel of Christ. Other than our Lord Jesus, you cannot think of a single you know, personality that was more sacrificial for the gospel of Jesus than the Apostle Paul. He said in 1 Corinthians 4 and 13, being defamed, we entreat. We're made as the filth of the world and the offscouring of all things until this day. He was regarded as filth for Jesus. He was regarded as the offscouring of all things. You know what offscouring is? When I was a young and I was the oldest, I had two younger sisters. But my mama believed in equality and washing dishes. And I had that task sometimes. Now my mama, I'm looking forward to your green bean, sister. But my mama knew how to cook a green bean, I'm telling you right now. She cooked them all day. Isn't that right? And a pot that was full was about half full by the time, you know, they were cooked. And they weren't even green anymore. Isn't that right? Nearly black. You know that stuff on the side of the pot? You know when it goes, that's off scouring. That's nasty stuff. I had to clean that up. Now listen to what Brother Paul said. Paul said, we're regarded as the off scouring of everything. The whole filth of the world for the gospel of Jesus. Did he sacrifice? Listen to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 beginning about verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labor is more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent. And deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice have I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in cold and nakedness. And besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the anxiety, the care of all the churches. I want you to listen to me. Brother Paul gave his life for the gospel of Jesus. I mean, we're talking about a man, watch it now, are you with me? We're talking about a man who was floating on a board out in the sea trying to get from point A to point B to tell people about Jesus. No, oh boy, sometimes we feel like we're really sacrificing, don't we? I was in St. Petersburg, Russia one time. And there was a very ugly man at customs who confiscated all of our material. He didn't find what I had stuffed in my socks and my shoes and some other parts of my body, the places of which I do not wish to discuss. He didn't get that. And then he reached out to take my Bible. It was not even this particular copy. But something just flew all over me, Larry. I, just, I held it to myself and I said, 
you know, to the interpreter, I said, tell him he's not taking my Bible. And she looked, I said, you tell him what I said. I said, I don't know this man. I've never been here. I don't know the rules. I said, but he's not taking this Bible. And then she told me that he said, if I didn't give him the Bible, I was going to jail. And she said, he said some other things, but I can't tell you what he said. And then I said, okay, you tell him if that's the case, the Bible and I'll go together. She said, really? I said, you tell him what I said. Guess what? I kept my Bible. You know, when I think sometimes, wow, what a sacrifice David made, you know, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. I don't know anything about sacrifice. I don't know anything about sacrifice when you think about what Brother Paul did for us concerning the blessed gospel of Jesus. Oh, I would to God that we would not, you know, play at religion, that we would have the kind of commitment that I could have the kind of commitment that Brother Paul had. And others who gave their very lives for the blessed gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Frequently, I will go to a congregation some distance away from home and I'll to do a gospel meeting and I'll come in on Saturday evening. I'll go and in, check into a hotel. The next morning, I go to the Continental Breakfast. And I remember Jasper, Alabama, I was trying to get to my room. I couldn't even get through the hallway for all these young'uns. And they were pretty nice. I said, I said, guys, I said, I need to get to that door over there. And they were nice, you know, let me through. And I said, by the way, what are y'all doing? Oh, we're here for the big swim meet tomorrow. And then at the breakfast, I could see them. They're all there, you know, getting their food and so forth. And it just breaks, it breaks my heart. I sit there and I watch those kids and I say, you know, not a one of these people are thinking about the Lord Jesus today. Not a one of them. And then you got their parents there with them. And they're not take, thinking about the Lord. And then I said to myself, these young'uns are going to grow up and they're going to be just like their mom and daddy. Not caring anything about the Lord. And so we have got to commit ourselves today to the gospel of Christ that Jesus comes first no matter what. Well, Uncle Tom and Aunt Mary dropped by. I couldn't be there today, Brother David. That just didn't crack a lot of ice with me. I've had things like that, and I've tried to say, I've said, not tried, I've tried to get them to go to church with me. They, oh, no, we can't do that. And I said, well, y'all stay here, enjoy yourself, whatever. We'll be back in a few hours. Is that right or wrong? You know that's right. See, that's the kind of commitment that we've got to have. I was doing a campaign over in the Carolinas, and boy, it was a long way. I was down in Florence, Alabama at the time. And uh, took 12, I think I even had maybe 14 students at the time. Then we used to have some bands, John, that would hold like 15 people. Didn't they have a sign, this will turn, roll over and, and kill you or something? But at any rate, I was up there. And, um, you know, here's an idea for you. If you build a new building, get a sign. What about that? Finally found the place. It wouldn't hold but about 75 people at the most. New building, gospel had never been there, and they called me to help them get the word out, all right? So I take a team there. We're going to work, you know, all week, knock doors and, and preach and so forth and so on. When I go to a church building, I want to know a few things. Number one, I want to know where the water fountain is. That's important to a preacher. Number two, I want to know where the bathroom is. Y'all kind of like that idea too, don't you? Number three, I want to know where the baptistry is. And I want to know if it's got any water in it. I want to know if it's got a, like I baptized a man one time, and there's a dead rat, you know, in the baptistry. I want to know, is this water clean? And I can tell this, look, look back here. I'm telling you, look, look at that. That's even moving water. Some people think that's better, don't they, Alan? <laughs> All right. But anyway, I want to know things like that. So I go to this building and I can't find the baptistry. And I said to the preacher, I said, where's your baptistry? Oh, we didn't put one of those in. Now, you don't have to have one in, right? You can go to the river. I've done, I've baptized people in rivers and ponds and you name it, bathtubs and everything else. 
So you don't have to have it. But I think if you're going to spend thousands of dollars on a physical structure, hello, you ought to put in there what God told us to do. Isn't that right? I thought of the Hosea passage. Israel builds temples and has forgotten her maker. I thought, have y'all forgotten the baptistry? Well, things are kind of slow here. And I just lose it. I'm telling you. I said, well, I'm not surprised. You know. So anyway, that morning... By the way, I woke the Christian preacher up two nights. He didn't like it much, like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Baptized seven people. I said to the Christian church preacher, I said, do you know that new building down the road? Yeah. I said, would you believe they didn't even put a baptistry in there? I shamed them. They ought to have been shamed, the very idea. And they hadn't had me back. And that's okay. I've had plenty of work. But I was preaching there and I was doing a lesson on evangelism, trying to get people, you know, excited to get out, and, you know, invite people, you know, to, to church and to study with people. And so at the end of the service, <clears throat> it's a very, very small, Alan, I'm up here at the front and I'm sort of getting my papers together or whatever. And this preacher comes up to me and he's wringing his hands. Somebody come up to you, y'all will do that to me, he's wringing his hands. He said, Brother David, we got a problem. Uh, he said, it's a big one. And I'm the kind of guy, I think, well, as much as I'm running my mouth, I must have offended somebody. I, I know every congregation's got their sacred cow or cows of some sort, and I must have crossed the line on something. I told him, I said, tell me what it is, and I'll repent, and we'll go on. I said, we got a lot of work to do. He said, well, it's a problem. I said, well, spit it out, brother. He said, well... Your lesson was 45 minutes long. I said, so what's the point? I've only driven, you know, 12 hours to get here. I'm the one that got the money together. I'm the one that got the transportation. I'm the one that got the workers. You know, it's not costing you anything for me to come here and work my liver out. I said, so why is that an issue? He said, well, the truth is our tapes are only 30 minutes long. Gospel truth. I said, for the love of Mike, man, go buy longer tapes. <laughs> Is that unbelievable? You know, here's somebody, we're worried about the length of a stinking tape, and we ought to be more concerned about, can we get the Word of God planted deep into the heart of a person in hopes that they will surrender themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? That's what we're trying to do. And so the gospel is something God wants us to tell people about. Number two, I only have two points for you. I had five. I'll just do two. <clears throat> the gospel is God's power to save. Isn't that what Romans 1.16 says? Because the gospel is God's power to salvation. The word power is from the Greek word dunamis, from which we get such words as dynamic, dynamite, dynamo. Dynamite's my favorite word. I love that word. I think it might be a guy thing. We like stuff that blows up. I mean, when I was a kid, for a nickel, you could get some firecrackers and you could buy, y'all remember those, some of y'all remember those cherry bombs and M80s? All that probably is against the law now. But, you know, I was the kind of guy, I'd say, I wonder what would happen if we taped two of them together. <laughs> you know, wow, did you see that? Boy, it blew that commode all to pieces, you know. <laughs> I mean, we had junk everywhere, you know. But at any rate, <clears throat> I like that, I like that word. Well, the gospel's God's dynamite unto salvation. It's His dynamite. It's His explosive power. It's His incredible power, you know, that can lead people to obey the gospel of Jesus. Now, let me tell you this. Why is the gospel God's power? I'm going to tell you why. You listen? It's a love story. Do you like love stories? I'm not talking about some Hollywood mess. I'm talking about a real love story. <clears throat> Turn to Romans 5. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible says, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commends His, what? Love toward us, and that while we were, what? Yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now listen to what he says. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Can't hardly find somebody to give their life for a righteous man. But that raises a question, who's a righteous man? A righteous man's a fair man. Let's say that you buy a car, from a righteous man. 
And you can do that. So you buy this car, you pay X for it, and you paid fair market value for the car, okay? So he dealt fairly with you, and so he's a righteous man, okay? Now notice what the rest of the text says. Perhaps for a good man, some would dare to die. Now who's a good man? Well, let me go back to my car dealer. <clears throat> the righteous man's going to give you a fair deal. You're about to leave. And the good man says, hang on just a minute. I want to tell you something. I want you to bring that car in here every 6,000 miles. I'm going to rotate the tires. I want you to bring it in every, what do they say now, like 5,000 or so miles. I'm going to change oil for you. not going to cost you anything. It's not built into the price either. I'm going to give you a new battery next year, whether you need one or not. I'm going to give you a new set of tires at 40,000 miles. That sounds like a good man to me. What do you think? And so what does Paul say? Let's go back to it. You can scarcely find somebody who will give their life for somebody who will give you a fair deal. You might find someone to give their life for a good person. That is a person who goes beyond, you know, the fair dealing guy. Now you got that in your minds? All right, but now look at verse number six. When we were without strength, this is easy to remember, three even verses, I'm going to give you six, eight, and ten. When we were the, without strength and ungodly, Christ died for us. Look at verse number eight. When we were sinners, Christ died for us. Look at ten. When we were enemies, we were reconciled by the death of the Son. And so when we were ungodly, when we were sinners, when we were enemies, Christ died for us. He didn't die for some righteous people. He didn't die, you know, for good people. God didn't look down and, and say, wow, look how righteous those people are. Look how good those people are. Look how they are so kind to each other. He didn't do that. He looked down and he saw people who were ungodly. He saw people who were sinners and he saw people who were enemies. And he said, I love those people and I want them to be my children. I don't want them to be like that. And I got a plan as to how I can get them to be my children. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I can tell you this story, but unless you believe it and obey it, it's not going to do a lot of good, is it? You got to believe it and obey it. You got to believe that the gospel saves you from your past, you know, sins. You got to do that. You see, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Saved from what? That's saved from the guilt of your sin. There's a, there's a, past salvation as it were there's a present salvation as we continue to grow and develop and then there's a future salvation when we go to heaven but see the gospel will save us from our past sins <clears throat> i was trying to get a man to come back to church he had fallen away <clears throat> i was trying to study with his wife this is a great story he was restored and i baptized his wife but in, a, in our conversation he said david ain't on he said, I ain't, ain't no need of talking to me. He said, I've done some bad, bad things. And you know the way we typically respond to Alan. I said, well, we've all done some bad things. He said, stop, you're not listening to me. And I said, okay, you got my full attention. I'm telling you I've done some bad things. And then he got to telling about Vietnam. And, you know, so, and, I, and I listened to him for a while. And then I finally stopped him. I said, now listen. I called his name. I said, I'm going to just say John. I said, John, I said, that's some terrible stuff you just told me. But I said, I want you to hear me say that my God can take care of all that stuff. No, he, oh, I don't think. I said, you got him in a box. I said, my God's out of the box. He's big. He can take care of whatever. And I'll listen to you all night if you want me to. But I am telling you that whatever you have done, God will take care of it. To, to Israel, the Bible says that he had his arms outstretched to a rebellious and a bunch of hard-headed people wanting them to come back to him. And so he ended up giving his life back to Jesus. That's the power of the gospel of Christ. Now, you can refuse to believe some things, but you've got to believe what I'm saying today if you're going to be saved. I mean it. 
You've got to believe it. You, <clears throat> I, was doing, um, I was doing something in Tuscumbia, Alabama. I can't remember now what. Oh, yeah, I was giving some lectures on Christian evidences. And, Alan, you had that course with me. I was talking one night about the argument from design for God's existence. <clears throat> and I said, you know, this argument says there's order and adjustment, and that implies design. You can't have design unless you got a designer. And so I used this simple illustration. I said, for example, you got the earth tilted on its axis 23.5 degrees. It makes a revolution every 24 hours. It's got a moon doing its thing about every 30 days. That moon's 240,000 miles away. And then I said the earth and the moon are revolving around the sun every 365 and one fourth days. The earth departs a straight line every 18 miles by one ninth of an inch, not by one eighth or one tenth, but by one ninth. And I said, wow, this is just incredible <clears throat> because of the design. You know, therefore, a designer exists. And at the end of the service, this elderly gentleman came up to me. I'd already heard about him. He was a, just a great man of God. He helped build the building, you know, that kind of thing. And he was short, bent over, arthritis. And it was one of those deals where he's kind of like this and then looking up at me. Y'all seen people like that? He, he bent over and looked up and he said, Brother Light. He said, I don't believe the earth revolves around the sun. I mean, he's serious now. He's nearly 90 years old. And he said, no, I'll tell you something else. I don't think man ever went to the moon. He said, I think they went up on some mountain out in Colorado and took some pictures and sent them back to us. Have you heard that, uh, what is it, E.F. Hutton commercial, I think? where it's deathly silent. This is after service. And everybody, were they were around me and they were watching, listening. And it, I mean, it got silent because of the respect they had for this old man. And <clears throat> anyway, I thought, it seemed like a long time. It was a few seconds. I put my hand on his shoulder and I called his name. I said, brother, I said, I understand that you helped build this building. That you're like the cornerstone here, you know, in its organization. And I said, I love you and I appreciate your good work. And I pray the Lord's blessings upon you and your remaining days. You know, just some small talk like that. And then he left and then I had these brethren, they swore me. They said, Brother Light, we thought you had one of those doctor's degrees. And I said, well, I do. Well, why didn't you straighten him out? And I said, well, a couple of things. First of all. He told me when he was a boy that they couldn't convince him. I said, now he's about 90 years of age. Who am I to think I got the power to change his mind now? And I said, number two, what difference does it make? I said, I don't care if he believes if you get on a boat out in the ocean and you go so far and you fall off the edge. I said, I don't care myself. I said, I think he's going against the best science that we have. But what difference does it make? I said, the difference that, that really is, is something that is significant is that we obey the gospel of Jesus. If he wants to believe man didn't go to the moon, fine. I don't care. But let me tell you what I care about today. I care about whether you obey the gospel. And whether you remain faithful to the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul says, To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from the heavens with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the, of the Lord and the glory of His power. And then Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 4 and 17, The time has come the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of those who obey not the gospel? I just told you what the end is. I'm telling you this because I love you. I feel compelled <clears throat> as a preacher of the gospel that whatever I might say, that I must tell people how important it is to be made righteous by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can do that today by confessing your faith, repenting of your sins, 
and being immersed in water as God commanded for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you do that, you'll be added to a family. We call it the church. Not a perfect family, but the greatest family this side of heaven. That's what we want you to do today. That's what I want you to do. And if you've done that, but perhaps in God's providence, you didn't even plan to be here today, but you're here. <clears throat> the gospel is what will keep you saved. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, by which also you are being saved. So the gospel saves us from our past sins. It saves us presently. And so if you've been unfaithful to the Lord, you haven't been the person you need to be, respond to the gospel. It'll keep you saved. And then there may be those who simply need prayer for encouragement. We do that too, don't we, as a family? And so if there's any way that we can help you, we, we earnestly beg you and plead with you to let us know that. And we're praying for that as we stand and as our good brother leads us in song.